Good morning, church. Take your Bible and open to Revelation chapter 19, please. All the way in the back of your Bible, Revelation 19. There is nothing, in my opinion, like athletics to demonstrate the triumph of the human spirit and the fallibility of the human body. Uh, ABC's Wide World of Sports put it like this for decades. It's the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. Uh, I personally know what it feels like to trot off the field a champion, feeling like a million bucks. There are few feelings in life better than that. But unfortunately, I also know what it feels like to slink my way off the field, hoping not to make eye contact with anyone because I had embarrassed myself in the game. Let me show you something. Remember this. This is my high school letterman jacket. This was a big deal when you were 17, right? I mean, if you gave this jacket to your girlfriend and you put her, your class ring on her finger and she wrapped it up with yarn because your hands were so much bigger than hers, and this coat just swallowed her, but when she walked through the campus, everybody knew she was my girl, right? Right? Uh, I remember the accolades of reward and athletics. I remember the recognition. In fact, I wore this jacket with great pride well into my late 30s. <laughs> Until Amy finally said, Michael, that's just sad. I can remember that recognition. Can't you? I can remember walking across the stage receiving a, an award and feeling good about it. It was a most excellent feeling. Well, competition and performance are pervasive New Testament themes. Don't know if you know that or not. In fact, the Apostle Paul must have loved athletics because he wrote about them often. Paul used all kinds of analogies in his epistles to try and make his point Using athletics, Paul wrote about long-distance marathon runners. He wrote about sprinters. He wrote about boxers. He wrote about wrestlers. Paul knew about athletic competition. And quite often in the New Testament, we're challenged then to compete, to go after the prize. In fact, that's what we're going to talk about today, reward. Reward is our subject for today. The Bible teaches that there is coming a day... When every follower of Jesus Christ is going to receive rewards for their life and the way they chose to live it, that's going to be our focus today. Now, if this is your first time, you're coming in right in the middle of a series that we started several weeks ago, I'd encourage you to go online to our website. You can watch all the messages and catch up. You can use our app and listen to the messages and catch up. Week one, we opened up with the return of Jesus Christ. Many, many times, Jesus promised his return. What's remarkable about it is that as many prophecies in the Old Testament that pointed to his first advent, a lot of people don't realize this, there are many times over Old Testament and New Testament prophecies pointing to his second advent. In week number two, we dealt with the two stages of his return. One of the reasons people are so confused about the return of Jesus Christ is because they don't realize it actually happens in two stages. It happens in two stages. There's the rapture at the beginning of the Great Tribulation. That's for the church. And there's the glorious appearing at the end of the Great Tribulation. And that's primarily for Israel. In week three, we examined the rapture. Remember, we went to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Paul gives details as to what it's going to look like. Jesus said the rapture is something we'll never see coming. In fact, according to your Bible, the rapture is the next big event for the church. Paul used the term caught up. The rapture is the catching up of Christ followers to meet him in the air. Last time we dealt with the great tribulation. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24 that the great tribulation would be a time of suffering on earth unequaled, unparalleled in human history. There's coming a day when God will judge the sin of mankind and it happens during the great tribulation. Today, we're going to deal with the judgment seat. While the world goes through a seven-year period of intense suffering, 
the church, having been raptured, will be experiencing three things. I pointed them out to you last time. The judgment seat of Christ, the marriage of the Lamb, and the marriage supper of the Lamb. At the judgment seat, Christ followers are going to be rewarded for their service. Now, you got to remember, this is for the church, not Israel. You see, one of the reasons people get confused when they try and study biblical prophecy is because they equate the church and Israel. They are not the same. Don't ever confuse the two. God has different plans for the church, the New Testament church, followers of Jesus, and Israel, the chosen people. Today we're going to talk about the judgment seat of Christ. In Revelation chapter 19, John reveals the events that precede the glorious appearing. So these things are happening while the world is going through the great tribulation. The seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, the bowl judgments, they have devastated the planet. You can read about those in Revelations chapter 6 through chapter 19. In the first 10 verses of chapter 19, John reveals what's going to be going on in heaven as the tribulation comes to an end. In fact, remember, Jesus said if God didn't end the tribulation, no one would have survived it. By this time, Revelation 19... Almost two-thirds of the world's remaining population is dead. And it happened during the Great Tribulation. Well, what are we doing? What are followers of Jesus doing at that time? Well, let's read about it. Look at verse 6. Revelation 19, verse 6. John writes, Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, like loud peals of thunder, He's referring to followers of Jesus Christ. Earlier in the passage, we're reading about Old Testament saints, those who are in already in heaven. Now we're reading about followers of Jesus Christ, a great multitude. Imagine for a moment. Some estimate that number to be approaching 3 billion people. 3 billion strong. Have you ever been to a large stadium? Some people go to big athletic events, even if they don't enjoy the game, simply because of the electricity in the stadium. There are lots of people who enjoy big crowds, thunderous applause, cheering and hollering and stomping of the feet. I've been to stadiums. They held 100,000 people. It is uncanny. It won't hold a candle to what John is describing. Keep reading. I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, the loud peals of thunder, and they were shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. You see, that's what the judgment seat of Christ is going to be all about. It's going to be giving God glory. It's going to be, I'm rewarded for my service, for my acts in honor of God, and then I know who made it possible. And I give them back to Jesus. There's a verse in the Bible that talks about people in heaven casting crowns at the feet of Jesus. You gave me what you gave me. I did what I did for you. Even the reward belongs to you. It's going to be an awesome time. For the wedding of the Lamb has come. And the bride has made herself ready. The church is finally with Jesus Christ. Paul uses this analogy in Ephesians chapter 5. Often in the New Testament, the church is considered the bride and Jesus is considered the bridegroom. Finally, after the judgment seat of Christ, the two are united. My faith is finally realized. It's going to be so overwhelming with that enormous number of people to realize that it was all true. That even though I had my doubts, and even though I struggled, and even though my life gave me experiences to question my faith, now, I'm overwhelmed with the reality of my circumstance. Here it is. It's real. John goes on. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given for the church to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's people. The fine linen represents our rewarded state. It's the church in rewarded state. Again, Paul said in Ephesians chapter 5, that Jesus desires to present the church to himself radiant, spotless, without a blemish, dressed in fine linen. Verse 9. Then the angel said to me, write this, Blessed, 
happy, joyful, filled up. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. Okay, here's the big idea today, church. I put it in the program. I want to throw it on the screen. There is a day coming when every action will either be rewarded or forgotten. There is a day coming for the follower of Christ where every action will either be rewarded or it'll be forgotten. Now, notice I didn't say punished. The judgment seat is not about punishment. You see, my failure, my sin, my shortcomings, my transgressions, they've already been punished. Christ bore in his body on the tree the sins of mankind. The judgment seat is not about sin. It's about reward. It's not about punishment. It's about blessing. There's coming a day when every action will either be rewarded or forgotten. Now, sadly, records as we know them are meant to be broken. Sadly, every world record set by a human being will one day be overshadowed by another. In fact, some gold medals don't last very long. Some winning efforts are enshrouded with controversy. It just takes a little time, and we're crowning someone new as champion. It's like, it's like this letterman jacket. You know, it's good for a while. It means something for a moment, but things change. People move on. Accomplishments are forgotten. Not at the judgment seat. Because the rewards given at the judgment seat are eternal. Oh, and by the way, even though we understand the fickle nature of success and glory, it's not just athletes who chase it. We all do. It's why we put in so much time at the office. We're hoping to get noticed. We want to be rewarded. We give up weekends. We work nights. We're looking for the promotion. Advancement. We practice up our golf game so we can go to our little local club and win a tournament. And the success is fleeting. It doesn't last very long. We fix up our houses and dress up our yards so when we entertain people, they can brag on our place. But it doesn't last for very long. We further our education so we can advance our careers. We can move up the ladder. We can reap the recognition. We exercise so we can flatten our stomachs. We can lean out our physique. It's the American way when you think about it. American culture is all about the glory. Go for the recognition. But it's only temporary. The Bible reveals that God has appointed Jesus judge. He's the judge whose rewards are eternal. They last forever. Paul says we're running a race. We're competing. In fact, the Olympic model that Paul refers to, as he often encourages his listeners and readers to make their lives count, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 20, 24, do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize. So run or live in such a way so as to get the prize. That's our summer camp verse for the week. Your children are going to memorize that verse this week. They're going to say it every day at summer camp. The Bible says that one day the books are going to be opened. And each person will appear before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. And we're going to give an account for our lives. And we're going to receive our reward. And everything we've ever done is either going to be rewarded and blessed and multiplied, or it's going to be long forgotten. It's going to burn up. Paul describes this whole process in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Why don't you turn there? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and I'm going to start reading in verse 1. Paul writes, For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, he's talking about his body. Paul says, We know that if this mortal, fallible, broken body dies, we have a building from God. Note the contrast. A temporary dwelling and a secure home. We have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven. That's our hope. That's why almost everybody believes in the afterlife. Everybody wants to believe in an eternal home apart from this broken body. It's how we get there that causes problems. Keep reading. 
Let me find my place. Verse two. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling. I'm tired of living in this tent, is what Paul's saying. Verse three. Because when we're clothed, we will not be found naked. Paul knew that when I die, that means I receive a brand new, immortal, glorified, eternal, spiritual body. That was a change, an exchange he was willing to make. Remember, a few weeks ago, we examined that process from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked, verse 4. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed. Now, if you're over the age of 30, you know all about what Paul means. Paul said, for while we're stuck in this tent, we groan, we're burdened, because we don't wish to be unclothed, we're naked. Look, the older I get, the more I realize how true this is, the more sense this makes. Let me ask you something. When you get home at the end of a long, hard day and you plop down in the recliner, how's that sound? Here's how it sounds at my house. Oh. That's how it sounds in my living room. When you wake up in the morning and try to get out of bed, how's that sound? Here's how it sounds at my house. Oh, oh, ah. Paul said, while we're stuck in this tent, we groan, we're burdened. We don't want to be unclothed any longer. Now, by the way, it's not just the physical breakdown of the body. Paul is also talking about the awareness and the understanding of what happens next. In fact, here he goes. Let me find it. Verse... Four, middle of verse 4, because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. That's an incredible contrast there. This is why a follower of Jesus Christ need not fear death, because death is nothing but a transition. Death is how we get to the good life, according to your New Testament. Verse 5. Now, the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. The word deposit there is an ancient Greek word, and it means sealed. Uh, maybe you've seen in a, in a movie set way, way, way back in time, uh, someone of great prominence and important, a king, for instance, would, would sign a document and roll it up, and then they would take soft wax and seal it together. And then the king would, using a ring or some kind of stamp, would imprint his insignia, validating what was in the letter. That's what Jesus, or that's what Paul is saying the Spirit does for us. The Spirit seals us. It's a guarantee that God will keep his word. Verse 6. Therefore, we are always confident, and we know that as long as we're at home in the body, we're away from the Lord. Verse 7, for we live by faith, not by sight. Do you? Do you really? You see, the life lived by faith is the life that's most rewarded, according to the Bible. Verse 8, we are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Hang on, wait a minute. Is Paul saying what I think he's saying? Is Paul saying he'd rather be dead? Let's read it again. We are confident, I say. In other words, I know what's happening next. And would prefer to be away from this body and at home with the Lord. If Paul made that statement in our culture today, we'd institutionalize him. We'd call him suicidal. Listen, church, it is very possible to love this life, to enjoy the heck out of it, to live it to the fullest, but still know the next one's even better. It's possible. That's why as a follower of Jesus Christ, I do not fear death. Verse 9, so we make it our goal to please him. That's pretty simple, isn't it? Knowing how this is all going to play out and knowing that one day I will be rewarded for how I chose to live my life in honor of him, I set out to please him. 
It's very simple. It's not too complicated. It's my goal to please him. The Bible promises rewards, both temporal rewards now here and eternal rewards as well for people who live with that mindset. I make it my goal to please him, whether we're at home in the body or away from it. Now, I want to focus on verse 10. Here it comes. Verse 10, for we must all appear. There's no escaping the judgment of God. Every follower of Jesus Christ will have his or her life judged by the Savior. Every person who rejected Jesus Christ, ignored Jesus Christ, will have his or her sin judged during the Great Tribulation and after. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. This takes place while the world's enduring the seven-year tribulation so that each one of us may receive what is due us. Church, listen. The judgment seat of Christ will be the most fair and impartial judgment in the history of mankind because Jesus is the judge. And you don't need to fear because as a follower of Jesus Christ, he's going to take everything into account. When I stand before Jesus and my life is examined, he's going to know about my upbringing. He's going to know about my opportunity or my lack thereof. He's going to know about what obstacles I had to try and overcome. It will be fair. It will be impartial. That's what the word do means. We'll receive what is due for us for the things done in the body, whether good or bad. Now, don't get confused here. This is not good versus evil. This is not righteous versus sinful. This is worthwhile versus worthless. Remember, the judgment seat of Jesus is not about punishment for sin. That sin is already covered. When Paul uses this terminology, he's talking about things that count and things that are forgotten. Things that matter and things that don't. It's not as if we should conclude, well, if I'm going to be judged one day, then I can't ever go to a ball game because that's a waste of time. I've got to be serving Jesus. I can't ever go on vacation because that's a waste of time. I need to be serving Jesus. No, 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 no. It, 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 the Bible never says that. The Bible teaches that when I go to the ball game and when I go on vacation, in my downtime, with my recreation, my sense of priority in life, all of it ought honor him. It ought be a reflection of my faith in him. Thereby, I can be rewarded for it. Last verse, one more time, verse 10. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due us for the things done in the body, whether good or bad. Bad. Let me show you a picture of what Paul's talking about. This is an ancient bima. This actually still exists outside the ancient city of Dan in Israel. The bima, or the bima seat, was a place of public proclamation in almost every city. When Paul used that term, judgment seat of Christ, he used a Greek word, bima, bima seat, and every reader in Corinth would have known exactly what he was talking about. It's like this big elevated platform in the middle of the marketplace and the mayor stands there and cuts the ribbon with the scissors, right? Public proclamations are made from the bima. When athletes return from the competitions, they walk the bima and they're rewarded for their service. That's the image that Paul is building. Paul himself had been to the bima. Paul himself stood at the bima in Corinth when the Jews opposed him and tried to run him out of town. He was judged at the bema. When Jesus stood before Pilate in John chapter 19, it's a bema. He's standing before the judge. That tells me Jesus knows what it's like to be judged. That tells me that Paul understands what he's talking about. Again, it was the bema in the city where the winners of Corinth's prestigious athletic contests were announced. So Paul's statement that believers will appear before the bema seat of Christ is as much a cause for joy and celebration as it is for motivation and focus. Run in such a way as to win the prize. This is very important. I don't want you to miss this. God will not be deciding the eternal fate of believers at the bema. Instead, every momentary decision, every action, every motivation will either be rewarded or lost forever. Turn back in your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 
Paul t- describes this process in more detail in his first letter to the church at Corinth. Look at 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 11. Paul writes, No one can lay any foundation other than that one that is already laid, which is Jesus Christ. In other words, Paul is saying Jesus is the only way to God. There is no other. And each one of us is building a life on that very foundation. Remember, Jesus said, you've got a choice in this life. You can build on the sand, which is shifting, or you can build on the rock. Paul's drawing on that same imagery. There's no other foundation other than Jesus. Verse 12, if anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, see the difference between the two? In one side, gold, silver, precious stones. Other side, wood, hay, or straw. Their work will be shown for what it is because the capital D day, the day of judgment, the judgment seat of Christ, will bring it to light. That's the day of the Bema. Keep reading. It will be revealed with fire. And the fire will test the quality of each person's work. He's drawing on an Old Testament image. The refiner's fire. You ever heard of that? The refiner puts the gold in the fire. And the gold, the high intense heat separates the gold, what is valuable, from the dross that is expendable. That's what the judgment seat of Christ is going to do. Our lives are going to be tested by fire. And if we've built on the foundation of Jesus Christ with gold and silver and precious stones, that's going to become our reward. But if all we've done is construct a life out of wood, hay, and straw by living for ourselves, answering only to ourselves, caring only for ourselves, it's going to vanish. It'll burn up, never to be seen again. Verse 14, if what is built survives, the builder will receive a reward. You are the builder, church. Follower of Christ, you are the builder. Your life will be tested by fire. What remains will be your reward for all eternity. Verse 15, if it is burned up, however, the builder will suffer loss, yet will be saved even though only is one escaping through the flames. Again, the judgment's not about heaven and hell. It's about how we manage life. So when I read these three passages, and I'm introduced to the idea or the concept of the judgment seat of Christ, it presents a problem, at least to me. In fact, the real challenge is this. In light of what we've read today, the real challenge is living in light of eternal reward. That's the real challenge. Because that's not easy. Life is too repetitive in my book. It's too mundane sometimes. It's too sour most days. How in the world can you keep that mindset? Let me offer you three quick things and I'll quit. Number one, you want to live in light of eternal reward? Then choose a life of growth. That's where it all begins. You make the choice. You see, the people who reach their potential in life are people who've committed themselves to improvement. Remember Paul in Philippians chapter 4 when he taught contentment? He said, you ought to get to a place in your faith where you're content with what you have. Never be content with who you are. There's always room for improvement. But be content with what you have. So your living in light of eternal rewards begins with a simple choice. And you can make that choice today. Here's number two. Start growing today. Don't put it off. The best way to ensure reward is to start today. No matter where you're starting from. Paul started as a murderer, a persecutor of the church, and yet all of that was covered by the blood of Christ, so so much so that in 2 Timothy chapter 4, when Paul was about to die, he said this, I have fought a good fight, I've finished the race, I've kept the faith, and I'm going to be rewarded. Start growing today. One of the things we forget is that all those people we admire out there, we forget that wherever they are now, They started where they were. That's true of everybody. When you look at that individual and you say, man, they've got it together. Don't forget, wherever they are now, they started where they were. And so can you. Here's number three. Concentrate on a few major themes. Narrow your focus. Jesus said, keep it simple. Matthew 6, verse 33. Seek God first in everything. Seek God first. Paul said, In 2 Corinthians 5, I make it my goal to please God. Anybody can understand that. 
I make it my goal simply to please God. We are tempted in our culture to overly diversify our attention. We're pulled in nine different directions, and all of them seem important to us. If you want to live in light of eternal reward, you've got to concentrate on a few major themes that are close to the intention of your heart. Make them matter the most. Remember the story in Luke chapter 12? Jesus told a story about a farmer who had a record year. I mean, he hauled in a bumper crop. He had more corn than he knew what to do with. He scratched his chin and wondered, what do I do with all my extra? I know what I'll do. I'll tear down my little barns. I'll build big barns and I'll store it up for the future. I'll kick back because I've won the lottery. This is the American dream. I'll eat, drink, and be merry for the rest of my life because I am set. And God said, you're a fool. You're a fool because this very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who's going to get all your extra that you stored up for yourself? And then Jesus closes that story with a chilling reminder. He says, this is how it will be for everyone who stores up treasure for themselves, but is not rich toward God. Being rich toward God means I set out to please him. I try and seek him first because I know that one day the books will be opened and everything I've done will either become my reward or will be long since forgotten. You know what this tells me when I read things like this? It makes me feel so good. It teaches me that my life counts. Today counts. Today's not just another day of many the repetitive, mundane routine as it goes on and on and on. No, it matters because someone's paying attention. Look, I can promise you I'm never going to set a world record, at least anyone that I'd be proud of. I'm never going to accomplish worldwide recognition, guaranteed, and you probably won't either. But I'll tell you what I do know. God's eternal glory, His eternal rewards inspire me to try and manage my life in a way that honors him so that one day, like many of you, I will be rewarded. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the promise of your word. Thank you that you are a just God. You're fair. Not only are you righteous and holy, Father, you are loving, gracious, and merciful. Teach us this day, this week, that we honor you every day or we don't. We please you every day or we don't. God, help us keep it simple. May we commit to growth. May we start today. And may we narrow our focus and refuse to be distracted, I pray. In Christ's name, amen. God bless you, Grace Community Church. I hope you make it a great week. I will see you next time. Yeah.